Now I give the microphone to Leonardo. Thank you very much. Grazie. Iniziamo la Thank you very much. Let's begin with the second part of this journey. So we framed the problem as well as the opportunities. There are many points that we can uh, pick up from the previous uh, speakers. Now, let's continue and let's try and uh, look at the actions. So how can we translate into actions and reality all the ideas that we've heard so far? Let's begin with the second panel. We're going to talk about design and engagement. This is the title of the session. I would like to call up here Marta Arniani, Francesca Bria, Marisa Parmigiani, Fabrizio Sestini and Paolo Venturi. We only have one microphone, the other one is now being fixed, so we'll make do with what we have. Now, we are still going to listen to international experiences, but uh, by chance this panel uh, includes only Italian people, so it will be held in Italian, but of course we'll provide the translation. Now, please, I would kindly ask our panelists to introduce themselves so that they can tell us who they are, what they do, and why they have to do with the topics that we are talking about today. I would like to start from the nearest one. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to the organizers for this day. It's been a great pleasure to listen to some of the speeches. My name is Fabrizio Sestini. I am an officer at the European Commission. I work at the DG Connect, which uh, focuses on research in telecommunication. It's been doing it for about 17 years. Uh, most of the time I've worked on uh, technological innovation projects, so innovation in the field of mobile networks, uh, internet protocols, etc. Then I started realizing that we have so many technologies and so few up useful applications of such technologies for social purposes, I mean in addition to economic goals. So I started developing an interest in uh, designing applications, so how to use existing technologies, especially network technologies, for social purposes. By the way, networks, networks of people, but also uh, knowledge networks, let's think of Wikipedia or sensor networks, uh, which can build a bridge between people and the surrounding world. Well, so how can this network uh, be uh, socially useful in addition to having an economic value, which of course is not neglectable? So. This is the reason why I am uh, here now. I work on projects which could be defined as social innovation in general terms, even though social innovation is an expression, is a word which uh, could be interpreted in various ways, and it's not always very clear. So uh, I will make some examples to better explain what I do in my, in my job. So I will present some cases of how technology can change the social uh, social organization. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, funny that we're all Italians here, although we all work abroad. <laughs> My name is Francesca Bria. I work in London and I've, been, I've lived in London for about five years. I come originally from Rome. I work with Nesta. It is a foundation which uh, focuses especially on social innovation. It's based in London in the UK. We work on projects in various fields. At the moment, we work mainly on the impact of the digital world in uh, social areas such as healthcare, education, and the new forms of economy. My background is in social sciences and innovation economy. First, I worked at the Imperial College as a researcher, and uh, I work at the crossroad between a social and economic analysis, so the social impacts of policies, in other words, the innovation policies and their impacts, and uh, the impacts of technologies in the definition of policies, but I also work on technological innovations, in other words, how to exploit to the fullest the potentials of networks, of ITCs, and digital uh, 
tools in order to strengthen the power of the communities and social networks with an impact also in uh, institutional uh, innovation. At Nesta, I coordinate two relevant projects uh, to the purpose of today's discussion. The first one, and we work also with DG Connect, it was commissioned by the DG Connect. So the first project is a map of the digital social innovation in Europe. So we studied the new practices, the new forms of uh, using the internet uh, to achieve a social impact. We look particularly at uh, grassroots innovation. In other words, the innovation that comes from the bottom up and which combines technology with innovations. We're looking at technological architecture based, however, on rights such as the right to privacy or the property of social data and how communities must be able to manage and define technologies because, as we've heard, they do influence social, economic and institutional models. So our work, of course, is related to European values. European Commission usually invests in centralized innovation models or tends to think that large companies can solve technological issues. Our approach is slightly different and looks at how we can invest in a systemic way so that policies can be at the service of grassroots innovation. Then we have a second project, I will talk about it later on, and uh, it involves uh, the new uh, European countries in order to bring together experiences of direct democracy through a network. So we look at new platforms for decision making, which connect social movements and citizens with institutions. We're also working on uh, crypto contracts, so encrypted contracts based on Bitcoin protocols, again, at the service of communities and social values. So we're also thinking, you know, a new face, a new side of money. A couple of words on the birth and development of Nesta, which is a rather interesting case. Well, Nesta now is an independent foundation. It is an endowment and it is also a charity. It's just created an investment fund for social innovation with good practices, especially in terms of impact investment. So, you know, how to impact, to, to evaluate the social impact of, project, of projects, following them throughout the development. We're trying to standardize some indicators and metrics. Of course, we look at, you know, the context, the social needs, and the variety of experiences. We want to standardize, but without standardizing too much. We do feel the need that we need to measure somehow the social value that we produce through our investment. We used to be part of the British government. So Nesta was part of a department of the British government. We were part of the Ministry for Skills and Innovation. And later, uh, Nesta became an independent uh, foundation. It's now a private foundation, as I said, which has social goals. Uh, its mission includes various stakeholders. Um, one of the ambitions that we have is that of working more and more on uh, incubation, support to innovation, accelerators. So we have, uh, uh, for instance, projects with the social innovation funds. Uh, our idea is to welcome and integrate uh, uh, social enterprises and new forms of innovation. Uh, even if they are small experiences. Our idea is to support uh, uh, the a fragmented innovation in order to achieve a more systemic innovation. Buongiorno a tutti, io sono Marta Arniani. My name is Marta Arniani. I have the same problem of Francesca. I, will, I may risk mix uh, some languages. Anyway, I work for um, 
uh, Sigma Orionis. Uh, it's a French uh, attempt at a Silicon Valley. Uh, we're located in an area which is a French attempt uh, at a Silicon Valley near the uh, Côte d'Azur. What we do is uh, trying to translate research into mar a market. Uh, we work especially on technological research, so we have international cooperation projects with Africa and China, and we also work on projects which are related to social innovation. I personally work on this within uh, Sigma Orionis. I'm a project manager for uh, projects funded by the European Commission. I will mention a couple later, such as Catalyst, and another one, one uh, aims at organizing international conferences on uh, uh, the topic of CAPS. It's a long acronym. I will explain it later on, or Fabrizio will explain it later. It's Collective Awareness Platforms for Sustainability of Social Innovation. This is the meaning of the acronym. The first event will take place next week in Brussels. I don't know if you can get organized at the very last minute, but I think it's a great opportunity if you're interested. Uh, there will be social fair will be there as well with a workshop, but uh, I will tell you more about it later. We uh, also work on the Catalyst project. Uh, now Catalyst uh, develops uh, tools. Uh, for open innovation systems, basically online platforms. In order to uh, harvest the wisdom of the people to try and find innovative uh, social solutions. We just close a great uh, experiences uh, called Connect, where we tried to create innovation around arts and technology. Again, that was a very interesting uh, project, but I'll talk about it later on during my presentation. Good morning, everyone. Maria, my name is Marisa Parmigiani. I am Italian. I work in Italy. I work for a company which is 100% Italian. Now, Unipol. Unipol, at the moment, uh, is uh, the most important insurance company in uh, Italy. And I believe that uh, uh, its history has always highlighted the topics that we're talking about today. Unipol was created 50 years ago from 36 cooperatives, with it, which in the Emilia-Romagna region had difficulties in accessing the financial insurance world. Banks basically wouldn't give them money. And insurance companies had difficulties in insuring these cooperatives. So uh, with a far-sighted approach, these cooperatives decided to invest some money to buy an insurance license to try and cooperate and help each other to give an answer to the problems that they shared. You need the approach, uh, the original approach continued. As all insurance companies, of course, you need to find some capital at some point. This is a typical problem of social innovation. How do I find capital, not only uh, the initial funding, but how can I create extra assets? And I am against the power of capitalism. So we didn't want to find money from the capitalists. So Unipol founded the first money they had from the German trade union. So the first member of Unipol was the German trade unions. Then the Italians found the courage. The Italian trade unions joined as well. Unipol today is a um, is listed uh, is a listed uh, insurance company, but it still preserves in its history and its identity the original approach it had, and Unipol still exists because it tries and meet a social need. This was the reason behind the creation 50 years ago. Of course, social needs today are diverse and different. Now I work on sustainability which has to do with the classic idea of social responsibility. For us, uh, sustainability rhymes with innovation in a way, and it follows two parts. First, innovation, and secondly, the social role of insurance, and it has a business uh, approach. The concept of social innovation for us 
is fascinating, is very interesting because it modernizes an historical, a consolidated approach. At the same time, social innovation introduces a new idea of market and uh, competitiveness and competition. I will talk about three main uh, topics in my talk. I'm going to talk about Unipol Idea, which was launched about a month ago. It is an enterprise incubator on social innovation. We work in five uh, typical areas, uh, sustainable mobility, welfare, he has the use of uh, the, the sharing economy that we mentioned before. And I agree, uh, the sharing economy at the moment is slightly distorted because there is an exchange of money. So it's uh, uh, less community-based than we would think. Well, to, also resilience and climate change. These are the five areas of the Unipol IDEA project. The idea is to accelerate enterprises which in these fields really bring about innovation. The idea of disrupted innovation, which is very difficult to translate in Italian, is uh, something that we really like. And uh, there are some hints in history, really. A few years ago, a small startup came to us. They had uh, uh, come up with the black box. It's maybe not that known in um, abroad, but in Italy we do have a problem in insurance, namely frauds. So the idea is, how can I ensure that uh, when I'm insuring someone, uh, there is, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, confidence that help will reach me. I mean, now we have all the tools, but it wasn't that the case uh, a long time ago. Also, when I buy an insurance, uh, when there is an insurance for car drivers, uh, you need to know how someone has driven in order to then manage. So, Basically, this startup uh, created a black uh, box for cars and for car insurances. And this uh, uh, changed completely our approach and our relationship uh, with uh, our customers. This changed completely the uh, insurance contract. It evolved, and then six years ago, we developed a paper, pay per use. Basically, what happens is that you don't just pay a yearly insurance fee, but you pay a uh, just the insurance only when you use a car. Uh, there are many insurance companies now that are paid for use. Uh, seven years ago, Unipol was the only one. It was a, a really uh, revolutionary innovation. Traditionally, insurance companies get their annual premium uh, rather than having this pay-per-use models. Then another important topic for us is territorial welfare. In Italy, people who have access to work also have access to health, uh, to uh, private pensions, etc. Those who do not have a job in structured companies have access to nothing. So in this de welfaring process, this is the outcome, this is the result that we're seeing. Now, a few years ago, we launched a program, and Turin will be a pilot city. So we're launching this territorial, this local welfare uh, for citizens. Again, I'll talk about it later on. Thank you. Paolo Venturi, direttore di Icon, grazie dell'invito. Icon è Paolo Venturi, I come from Icon. Icon is a, a center for research which stems from the need to include uh, social topics in uh, academic research, starting from an economic perspective. This uh, is uh, very much in line with the topic of social innovation. In the past, there was a big dichotomy between social innovation and uh, uh, profitable innovation. For a long time, this was a problem. We're trying to bring together these two aspects. So we are trying to include social innovation. To look at social innovation is something that also creates value. This was our challenge, the challenge of ICON, which, as I said, is a study for research at the University of Bologna. It's supported by many actors, for instance, by the cooperative movement as well and by other subjects as well. 
by the way, the University of Bologna has delocalized uh, uh, many faculties, and in uh, Forlì we have the Center for Social Innovation. So we've tried to bring together these two aspects, social and economic. In Forlì, 15 years ago, the University of Bologna created a degree course in social economy. This is not advertising, I'm just saying it because it has to do with social innovation. I mean, the social aspect has always been uh, um, included. Did, uh, but as an add-on to economy, you know, as ICON, we're trying to bring the two together, putting them on the same level. The idea is to change the economy. What we need is not a new definition of what is social, but what we need is a new definition of what is public and what is economic. The idea of social innovation that we are developing with our master courses, uh, etc. We have, for instance, a master course on cooperation, and etc. We belong to uh, international networks such as the MERS network. So our goal is to abandon this marginal uh, role of the social aspect. We want to put it at the core of the uh, economic uh, thought and also in the definition of policies. We organize uh, events. We are a sort of Chernobyl of uh, the non-profit. We organize days in Bertinoro, beautiful place. Um, the rising inequality gives us an opportunity to think once again about how we can uh, bring together the idea of justice with the idea of value. We are carrying out our research, and I will talk about it later, because I think that this is the key. To how can justice go hand in hand with value? And I think that uh, it will be interesting to have uh, a discussion on this. Thank you. Bene. Quindi siamo partiti dal, dal concetto di rinascimento, dal voler... So we started with the concept of uh, renaissance and reinterpreting a social dimension that should not be marginalized, but that should be central, and that's the starting point that gives us a very useful vantage point. Now, our subclaim uh, is about... Uh, fighting the imbalances that we are facing today. We need uh, to find the right tools to face uh, these uh, problems. So we wonder how much we need uh, to provide a fixed uh, structure to a word that is actually very dynamic and very much uh, in uh, constant evolution. So we don't want to slow down this uh, process. Here we're talking about design and engage, design in its widest sense and engage in the sense of, of course, engaging people and fostering closer relations between institutions and people and between individuals. Well, we need to find the right balance there too. So in this sense, I ask you, which are the instruments that we can use. We heard about technology, we heard about models and finance, and uh, there are, however, also other components, which are, in your view, the key components uh, that uh, will uh, allow us to operate through design and engagement without hindering uh, the development of this process, uh, the process that is afoot, possibly Quite the opposite, how can we contribute uh, to ease the way in the right direction, not in the wrong one, as we heard before? Well, design. Uh, and you also mentioned uh, the emerging uh, of a new kind of solutions. I believe that emerging is a key concept here from the bottom up. We need many more Olivetti's and uh, much fewer Agnelli's for the future because we need uh, this kind of approach to solve issues uh, from now on. 
sustainability well when thinking about that the first thing that strikes you of course that comes to mind is the environment of course but sustainability has many faces in fact the environmental dimension is very important but there's also an economic face it that's just as important people tend to forget that as uh, we all know economics uh, the economic dimension means not only finding new sources of uh, money, but also finding uh, new ways to use that money and to put it to good use. Most significantly, many communities are growing uh, in a way that is uh, clearly not sustainable. So where do we find a solution? Where, which is the right direction that we should follow in the future? Well, the European Commission indicated the way towards uh, sustainable growth uh, for the future. And I believe that sustainable growth is a sort of oxymoron, is a contradiction in terms. So we cannot have a quantitative sustainable growth on a planet that has a limited size where the population is growing exponentially, constantly. And the needs of this population are also on the rise. There can be perhaps a quality growth, but not in terms of, uh, but not a, a growth in terms of uh, available resources, because uh, it's actually the opposite. Uh, fewer resources will be available in the future. So social innovation becomes all the more important today to engage people. ICT and internet networks and uh, knowledge networks become all the more important, therefore, because they bring together people and because they create new ways uh, to build on the collective intelligence uh, to solve issues. I like uh, to talk about SafeCast, which is a system that was launched uh, in Japan after the Fukushima disaster. Everybody was, of course, worried about radiation, so there was uh, a boom in the sale of Geiger meters, device, metering devices. Uh, and someone said, why should I measure that radiation is only about myself? So they developed a, a system uh, that uh, brings together a Geiger meter with a, a GPS uh, system uh, and a Wi-Fi network in order to measure um, geoposition and measure different uh, radiation values according to a card wrapping uh, process so that anyone can access uh, this information in real time uh, throughout the world. In actual fact, of course, uh, depending on uh, the availability of this device. Uh, uh, throughout the world, of course. Now, this is a good example of how citizens, anyone, can really contribute to spreading information that's very important, uh, has a great value for all, that no individual government agency would be able to create and probably would not uh, like to make available to its uh, citizens uh, if they had it. Uh, this kind of technology has a very disruptive effect on uh, the status quo. So back to engaging and how engagement, uh, how important engagement is. Well, engagement is essential through this kind of approaches, through this kind of systems that foster social innovation. I have a question about uh, the process, the instruments that we heard about, metaphors, uh, we heard about different references. However, over the past, I would say, 10 years, we've seen a shift from a functional, grid-like, uh, departmentalized approach to a different uh, view of the word as a complex uh, entity institutions. Uh, and I think, uh, for example, about uh, the European Union have uh, had a very structured approach to fostering innovation, for example, calls for proposals uh, divided uh, by sectors. However, there is uh, maybe the possibility to consider other ways to engage the community to foster innovation. Because after all, the word uh, 
is uh, no longer what it used to be. And of course, uh, things are happening at a different speed. So is the European Union taking these uh, possible alternatives or additional alternatives uh, into account? Well, there are, of course, bureaucratic forms. Uh, uh, there is a form, a formal level and a content level. We have content pl uh, platforms, uh, sustainability. Now, contents uh, focus more specifically on a multidisciplinary approach. We don't want projects that are exclusively technology-oriented. Technology we, we do not would not want only industrial partners, uh, productive partners. We also want uh, projects that go beyond technology as such. Uh, the economy, for example, the arts, all the various areas that uh, are traditionally not that interested in the IT word per se. Clearly, the formal bureaucratic aspect uh, is also important because we know that we need to address the needs of civil society and therefore we need to understand how best to reach out to the people. The ICT project that we finance is a collaborative research project, so we want to foster joint research projects uh, between different member states. But it's also true that uh, when we work with small Partners, uh, when, when you work with small partners, uh, it's not easy to find uh, joint. Uh, to, it's not easy to find uh, someone to work with uh, at European level. And let me add that there's also one more aspect to bear in mind. It's quite complex to participate in a call for proposals at European level because we have administrative. Uh, constraints because, of course, we're talking about funds uh, that come from 27 different countries. So we need to follow very strict rules, financial rules that uh, cannot be oversimplified. So no matter how much we're working uh, to cut through all the red tape, uh, the Horizon 2020 program uh, cannot do miracles in this sense. Of course, uh, there can be side effects. Uh, if we simplify the bureaucratic aspects, uh, there may be detrimental effects also in terms of contents. But of course, we are trying uh, to be more flexible towards smaller players. And we are also trying to award funding uh, to institutions that uh, redistribute in turn our funds uh, through social innovation actions on a much smaller scale that, we, of course, we would not be able to manage on a European scale. There is a project uh, that's uh, been uh, part of uh, the first uh, CAPS uh, call, which is called CHEST. They have a two and a half million uh, euro budget. Uh, the funding will be broken down uh, into 50, 60,000 uh, euro chunks. Uh, these will be oriented towards uh, social innovation projects uh, open to European operators. Uh, and uh, the selection process will be guided by an evaluation of uh, project excellence as well as crowd funding. This will be a key aspect in the selection of uh, the projects. Uh, very last question for you. Are there rules uh, that should be followed scrupulously, more scrupulously than others? Uh, there are impact evaluation considerations that come into play here, I believe, because it's very important to evaluate uh, the ultimate impact of a project that goes beyond uh, the um, financial considerations and bureaucratic considerations. You need to be able to evaluate whether or not a project uh, has uh, delivered uh, as much as it promised uh, it would. So how do you approach this issue? Well, impact. Uh, Measurement has always been uh, quite uh, a tricky business, uh, and uh, many technological programs uh, 
require an impact evaluation phase that is very significant. And uh, project evaluation, uh, in this sense, uh, is uh, very important. And social innovation, well, we're talking about a field that is completely new. So it's very difficult to evaluate sometimes what the social impact is, especially because in multidisciplinary projects that there are different impacts that come into play, so it's difficult to evaluate them. However, there are many studies of food, and one in particular has been led by Nest on Digital Social Innovation that's trying to... Francesca will be telling you about this in greater detail. Now, the project aims to map social innovation initiatives at European level in order to evaluate uh, their impact and uh, their potential. Yes, indeed, I close with you on this note because Francesca will be telling us about this, uh, about innovation also in the instruments uh, like challenge prizes and other initiatives uh, that uh, you can put uh, in uh, play to make a difference. Yes, indeed. And uh, however, I would like to start with a comment about the initiatives that have been carried out by the Commission, which is in itself what we heard, a disruptive innovation uh, compared to what the Commission is used to doing, programs like uh, CAPS, uh, the Collective Awareness Platform, as well as uh, crowdfunding uh, applied to public uh, funds. So, well, these are innovations that uh, are very valuable, also because they are applied uh, in diff to different uh, contexts uh, that are sometimes very challenging, because sometimes the institutions are very distant from what's happening in the real world. So I believe that uh, these are steps forward uh, that uh, are not enough, but that uh, surely can make a difference. Uh, I would like uh, to discuss this point. Uh, what is the role that we can expect from uh, public policy making? Because I wonder what can be done outside of politics, because without uh, the kind of political determination, political willingness to recognize what must be changed, uh, and uh, that, that, that comes even before changing, uh, one should be able to do something without being afraid of being disruptive. If we take very seriously what we heard uh, this morning and uh, many of the experiences that uh, you bring with us and uh, that you share with us uh, today, well, that uh, means uh, that uh, we are questioning the role of the public, uh, of the public dimension, the government, uh, large uh, technology players. Uh, I mean, some of the challenges uh, definitely lie there. Public, uh, the public and uh, the political world to have uh, to be have to work together, because I'm an elevation scholar, so I don't believe in disruptive innovation as a sort of uh, magic wand. I believe that's not the case. I believe that we need uh, to have a more structured approach because we need to be very sure about what we want to disrupt, or to destroy, to wipe away, what we want to replace. Well, the welfare system is important, and that's important. We don't want to do away with it. Uh, education is important. Transport, public transportation is important. We need to make sure where our needs lie so that we can invest there. These are key issues, are priority issues. So you're not just uh, getting rid of uh, everything that's there because it's old, because it doesn't work. Democracy is uh, quite fragile. so. Sometimes it can appear a bit, a bit daunting to, and to try and find a solution that's a sort of panacea, a sort of solution for all the evils of the world. That's not what technology is about. It's not what social innovation is about. We heard about uh, instruments as institutional innovation. However, we also need. Uh, a new, 
a new kind of imagination because many of the examples that we have heard uh, bring us back to something that's more familiar like Silicon Valley. How do you innovate in Silicon Valley? What's the sharing economy about? Now, I don't think uh, that uh, this kind of innovation comes only through Airbnb and uh, so on and so forth. Maybe a sharing economy can go through these players, but it's not only about that. So imagination can really help us there and can help us see things differently. So in my view, predatory capitalism and the concentration of financial resources coexists with the social innovation, which is uh, disruptive, uh, which comes from the bottom right now. But it's not just about uh, the, this opposition. Sometimes I work uh, with uh, the European Commission as an expert. I always ask uh, about uh, the role of Europe in this context. Uh, we heard uh, before from our Indian colleague, uh, we heard him say we need to be careful because we are risking the financing of social life and social services. Uh, and that's true, of course. Uh, that's uh, Google, Airbnb. That, that's the kind of business uh, that uh, leads uh, to the sale of uh, personal data. And that's not uh, ethical at all because citizens have no control on their personal data. We know about that. So it's a sort of uh, financialization of personal relations and personal data in a way. So that's true. And that it's true that that's a risk. However, we should not only reject this kind of behavior and say, OK, that's a risk. So I will defend lobbies and I will uh, defend uh, taxis and hotels. I think that it's a different matter. The matter is uh, facing up to the challenge uh, and uh, considering, for example, new ways uh, of approaching the issue. Perhaps uh, the sharing economy can be something different. And however, we do need uh, policies and regulations and uh, legal frameworks uh, that uh, reflect uh, the needs of modern technology. Sometimes, uh, these issues uh, take time at European level so that uh, you finish a consultation with stakeholders about personal data and things have already changed dramatically and what you just finished doing is no longer relevant. So that's an issue that we need uh, to bear in mind. Well, you talked about a sort of juxtaposition, uh, this approach that must not necessarily be disruptive. Uh, you must actually build on what's already there so as uh, to foster development uh, and uh, development in its widest uh, sense. Now, which could be useful instruments in this sense? What kind of, uh, for example, education and skills you could provide uh, also at government level so that uh, this kind of issues are not uh, scary? anymore, but that it can be integrated rather than swept under the carpet. Because I believe that this kind of approach, the one that you recommend, can lead to an education awareness that can make a difference. Perhaps uh, through uh, different experiences, it will expand over time to become communities in their own rights. What do you think about this kind of uh, approaches? Well, yes, I mentioned, for example, the CAPS approach by the Commission. That's one of the possible solutions. This is uh, the kind of approach that I think will work. Experimenting, uh, being pioneer, having a pioneering approach. A very holistic approach. I believe that much remains to be done at technological level, for example, through distributed architectures and uh, um, 
attributing a greater relevance uh, to privacy and active participation of uh, the citizenry in uh, public policy making. We have a process that's called decent. Uh, Decentralized citizen engagement technology. We're working with the nine countries across Europe uh, to create uh, a technological federation based on open source uh, software, hardware, and data that would uh, facilitate the federation of all the various decision making mechanisms and uh, interventions in public policy making. Iceland, in Iceland, for example, Iceland is one of our partner partners. So this approach has led, for example, to the reconsidering of uh, the Icelandic uh, constitution, for example, or there's a platform in Iceland about uh, um, the, the needs of the citizens. The citizens can uh, draw up uh, legislative proposals, uh, and if they get enough uh, signatures, uh, they can then uh, bring uh, their proposals to uh, the attention and to the vote of the parliament. Uh, which other instruments are available out there? Well, there's a digitalsocial.eu website where you can find other instruments in this sense. Here, Nesta has a very interesting initiative in place, which is the Alliance for Useful, is the Useful Impact Alliance. This project uh, creates, uh, aims to create a greater standardization between different metrics uh, of uh, social innovation projects, uh, and that uh, in order to increase the impact of these uh, projects, we want to increase the kind of uh, accuracy of data collection, how to use these uh, uh, data, We heard about design and engagement. I believe that the two need to go together hand in hand. That's what we are trying to do in developing our platform. We are using iterative design. Uh, in our platform uh, because we want communities to be there right from the start. You shouldn't be afraid of failure. You should be quick. You should uh, develop uh, when the needs are clear, when you have a feedback from the community. So you shouldn't just waste public money using uh, on uh, technologies that no one will ever use or that will be ready three years uh, later. Other instruments for innovation can be found uh, in uh, finance and, uh, for example, we have created the Center for Challenge Prize, uh, which uh, aims uh, to set up uh, contests uh, for a prize. Uh, I cannot really say it in Italian. We are trying uh, to address large issues, uh, large, uh, very, very important issues at world level, like malaria and other such issues. So we have managed uh, the Social Innovation Prize for the European Commission, for example, uh, in line with the, the CHEST project uh, that aims uh, to streamline uh, the evaluation, project proposal evaluation, and uh, to foster greater direct uh, participation on the part of uh, innovative stakeholders who want to have uh, a more direct target of uh, the problems that we need uh, to solve through technological solutions. And then there is another aspect uh, that can be important. That is to say, how to embrace a systemic innovation. Sometimes you know, social innovation projects seem very fragmented, very small. And sometimes even the people who are involved in these projects uh, find them uh, very small and find it difficult to see the big picture. I believe that, on the contrary, we need uh, to embrace uh, a more mainstream approach. We need uh, to make sure that these projects grow, that they grow pervasively without neglecting uh, their need for autonomous growth. One of the examples uh, that I think are very telling about what Nesta is doing has uh, to do with uh, digital e-health, and that's uh, how 
health-related information becomes knowledge commons. And we also bring uh, together these various uh, elements that make up the e-health system uh, from stakeholders to hospitals and we reconcile various aspects and we use them in the best possible way to make sure that each patient is in charge of his or her data so that they're fully aware of what's happening to them. This is the kind of systemic innovation that can really make a difference. And clearly, here, technology can make a difference, even though, of course, we need to bear in mind that no matter how promising some platforms may appear, like big data, for example. Well, technology sometimes uh, uh, brings together, aggregates, recommends, but that's only part of what technology can do. Technology is very good to do something, but uh, does not work well, well to do other things. So you need to bear the big picture in mind at all times. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like uh, to ask the same thing to Marta, because uh, you work with Europe very much. You work with similar projects very much. So I believe that uh, you're very familiar with uh, scale-related issues and uh, virtuous uh, examples and uh, best uh, practices in this sense. So perhaps sometimes you are you have seen uh, cases in which fear plays uh, a big uh, part. Well, I think that at the end of the day, there are even too many platforms. Maybe we need a smart de Increase of what already exists, a smart degrowth rather than an addition of new and further uh, innovative uh, System. So I think that one of the most important uh, points is that we are at a time where we are thinking and we're working on two different levels, which have been created by the speed with which some uh, technologies and systems have developed. So on the one hand, we have a problem of uh, literacy, of basis literacy, and uh, there is uh, a uh, gap. I mean, the literacy to technology is, of course, related to empowerment. So even before talking about engagement, we need to talk about awareness and uh, empowerment. And on the other hand, those uh, who were quick, the first ones, those who have been working for social innovation, are already part of a uh, system with its own uh, language, its rules. Uh, so on the first level, we just need education, education to fast-paced change, education to the uh, possibility of being a central actor, a key actor of uh, each one's life and context. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but I think that participation is a very individualistic feeling. So if I feel committed, if I participate, that uh, has to do with me, with my values, uh, my community. So there is an individualistic side to it. If we think, uh, for instance, of the maker movement, there is an enthusiasm at the basis, which is in a way solitary or personal or individual. And uh, luckily then it uh, grows to a community and it produces very relevant and interesting results. I believe that uh, those uh, who are in the other bubble, in the other area, must get out of this bubble. Um, and um, this to us is a very important 
value. We think that interdisciplinarity is uh, extremely important. This is a practice that we try and uh, include in all the projects where we are involved. So rather than reinventing the wheel, we try and uh, bring together different sectors, different types of research and different types of communication. One of the recommendations of our Connect was to create more open situations, more situations where not just one artist, one creative person is integrated in the research project to make it nicer and to communicate better. But uh, these artists should be included right from the beginning because they could add, they could contribute with disruptive elements with new uh, aspects in the methodology of that research. So I think that we do need open systems uh, rather than systems which are influenced by a goal. In a way, this is also, I mean, we're talking about social innovation. And why do we want participation? Well, there is a philanthropic side to it, which is good, but there is also a business side to it. We want uh, this uh, system to make it work. We want this sector to work. And uh, in a way, I think that uh, it is uh, important to find methods to redesign and restructure participation or what we believe as a participation. There's one thing that I believe is very important in the catalyst system is that we have uh, uh, tools and there's a process which makes sure that some ideas emerge rather than, uh, 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 than others. How can we make sure that these ideas and actions are representative of the original uh, intents? and intentions. Catalyst looks at these problems from a very technical perspective, namely how can we improve an online system, an online decision making and a selection and voting method. One of the risks is uh, having platforms where people just click on like, but this doesn't necessarily take us to any result. I think that uh, what is in between is very important. It's hard work and also it's uh, hidden work because you're not celebrated if you've just uh, written a better code line, but it's still a very, very important uh, task and a very important job. We have a few minutes left, but I would like to ask uh, Marisa if the design and engagement tools, in your experience, must be vertically integrated, uh, raising awareness, accelerating projects, and having financial tools, uh, do you need to have them all in-house? Or do you need platforms to engage further actors to involve them and create a virtuous example? which can then be a poster child. Well, I'll try and be short because it's now lunchtime. Our culture comes from participation. So my answer is very easy. You can't do much by yourself. Uh, when we talk about the well-being of people, of course, we are talking about uh, the involvement of various actors. When we talk about innovation process, and we heard it in the morning, we, of course, we need a mix between different skills. Vertically, you can't really do much, and you also waste resources, I believe. On the projects I mentioned before, on Unipol Ideas, well, we started in partnership with the universities and we started from partnerships with incubators which exist and are operational and we are developing further an additional 
partnerships with other incubators. Our idea is to attract people to Bologna and then send them back home after the acceleration. We are interested in solving problems that uh, cannot be solved elsewhere. So this is our uh, approach. We want people to go back to where they came from after receiving our support and uh, a solution. So we are trying to develop local relationships with those who are already active in different regions. Once our accelerated companies go back home, they need to be welcomed in an appropriate and an adequate environment. So that's why we need these further partnerships. When I presented the call, I used to say that uh, we were going to be very intense in our approach, that we were going to kidnap them. You know, when people come to us, they come over to us, we eat together, we spend a lot of time together, and they were lucky that we couldn't find any flats, because otherwise they would have slept uh, with us as well. That's the strength of the community and support among teams and between teams. Um, so it's a very intense work, but then we want our companies to go back to where they came from. We had cases where different teams met and n new ideas uh, developed in addition to the ones that we had developed and funded. I believe I was probably misunderstood. Uh, welfare comes and, fro and stems from the right of uh, people. I mean, in Italy, it's developed in three levels, uh, national, local, uh, and uh, very local uh, welfare. So we have the state, the regions, and the municipalities, of course, in a view of local welfare. What we are trying to do together with public uh, institutions is uh, creating new opportunities to offer service to those who do not have access to private welfare. Private welfare already exists. We don't need to strengthen it. Uh, we just uh, need to find a way to integrate uh, new opportunities and new services. We need to help people access uh, w public welfare to those who normally can't. So we want to be different, uh, but together. I don't need those who are exactly like myself or those who are different. Uh, and I think that bringing together different skills uh, is extremely important. In 1995-96, the Copenhagen Center defined the public partner, the public-private partnerships as uh, a, a, a model which I believe is still very current. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, these kind of partnerships are not fully exploited in practical terms yet. Paolo, can we sum up? Because uh, lunch is uh, waiting for us. And uh, can you give us an idea of possible hybrid models, of a possible harmonization of all the aspects that we've talked about? I'll try and be brief. First of all, Disruptive design, I work in research and uh, the design should not be placed at the end of the process but rather the beginning of the process. Uh, we are talking here about inequality but inequality has become part of the system in a way, kind of accepted. We need to change the paradigm now, otherwise uh, we work only to solve the problem and fix the problem, but the problem is at the root. So we need to start from there. Also, the non-capacity to innovate comes from the inability to take on a different perspective. So this disruptive part of everything is at the origin, is at the beginning. It's not just a problem of technicalities of, or uh, design, but rather vision. How do we produce value? And in a way, the sharing economy is showing us that collaboration can create value. Fine, but that's not enough. Today, in order to produce value, we need three aspects, the economic one, the institutional one, but also the social dimension is important. And they need to be recombined together in a different way. When policies are developed in the economic field, or in, uh, in public institutions or in the social field, these three elements must always be recombined. The ability to create value is now three-dimensional. If you're still looking through 2D glasses, you're missing a part of reality and you're basically producing endogenous inequality. The problem of inequality, although it is a matter of public expense, let's just think that Italy only spends 0.1% of the GDP. Uh, 
even though public uh, expense is 50% uh, of GDP, much less than the average of the 27 EU countries. So it's not just a matter of public investment, but we have a problem of perspective. And by the way, development is not growth. Development means uh, removing obstacles, uh, removing uh, the protagonism of objects. But we need development to then have growth. Without development, you can't have growth. Growth by itself is not enough to create jobs, for instance. Jobless growth does exist. Growth doesn't necessarily create jobs. This is what is happening today. So the problem is at the root. And I have five points to mention, which I think are very important. First, we need to move from a dual vision to a multiple vision of development. The subjects of uh, development are not just the state and the market, but also civil society. This is very clear. Just look at the ISTAT census of non-for-profit organizations in Italy, and you will see that this world has doubled the number of jobs, but it's also doubled its economic value. Also, we need to move from uh, segregation to co-production. Goods and services should not be built in two times. First I collect, first I harvest through tax, and then I redistribute. No, I need to co-produce in Matera, a consortium of social enterprises, through the involvement of some families, which set up a panel, solar panels on their uh, houses. Well, part of the production is kept for their own consumption. The rest has become a fund for the community. These are uh, turned into hours of home assistance. So what does co-production mean? It means that stakeholders become asset holders as well. And they contribute not only with economic resources, but also with social resources as well as know-how. Vulnerability today is not the same as emergency. Vulnerable subjects today do have resources. We need to co-produce in order to use and exploit all these existing resources. Then we need to promote inclusive uh, uh, companies rather than extractive resources. I'm not talking about profit or non-profit. There are communities which produce value within this community and society and give it back. There are other companies which delocalize, and this has to be changed. I mean, if we want to feed development, we need to promote inclusive companies, uh, uh, companies which are able to produce value and root it in the local territory and uh, region. Then we need to move from a culture of service to a culture of support. You can't just finance a person and a need. We need to fund the ability of a person, like the capability of a person to innovate. In Parma, they created, for instance, an emporium which helps the needy people or poor people who can access it. Because they're part of a list in the public administration, they can access to goods and services provided by the community. When they go and take these goods, they're not just asked to thank. No, they're asked to give something back in terms of time. So they give their time in exchange for a good or a service. This is not just empowerment. It's also a way to improve the self-esteem of people so they can emerge from poverty. Poverty is not just a matter of resources, but also of relational traps. Another disruptive element, I think, is that of policies. Policies must be oriented to the outcome rather than the output. In the last years, we've seen some jail projects in jails whereby uh, people have not relapsed into committing crime. Uh, this is a, a now. This is a, an important result. So I think the policies must promote existing innovation. Innovation happens; it's all around us. So policies must enhance it. I think this is the really disruptive point. So we need to change our vision first, and also we need to 
give uh, strong resources and legs to existing innovation. It's innovation is in the present, it's not just in the past or in the future. Thank you very much. I think that we need to close because it was very late. I thank you very much. Uh, I think that during lunch we'll have uh, time to exchange our views. We will resume at 2.30. So uh, we will meet again at 2.30. Uh, some information will be given as for the lunch, which will be served on the top floor. Thank you very much.